Thank you very much for this for this wonderful talk. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm opening this up to questions by the audience. So you already get clapping here. Thank you very much. <laughs> so who wants to start with a question? Anybody from the virtual audience? Just unmute yourself or raise your hand if you're shy. Okay, obviously everybody is totally shy. So I will, <laughs> I will, I will, I will start a bit. So, so um, looking at what you're doing, basically building, building up a, a, a bigger um, local cluster of GPUs that very efficiently talks to each other. Usually, this very much uh, uh, coincides with the uh, with the development over the last five six years of having really fat nodes in a large HVC system with a lot of local computing power, mm -hmm. essentially for the same reason to reduce communication to the to the outside. So already one of those nodes is by itself a, a, a little supercomputer. So this is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, um, one thing that struck me, of course, this is a this is a um, very good way of looking at it because you have basically a, a, a single unit and then you have all these units communicating with each other. And I saw something like 256 GPUs. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking more of 4,000 nodes. Uh, and, and the amount of data that, that is distributed. So, so my understanding is, of course, these then if you have if you have ginormous amount of money, of course they're all interconnected via an n-dimensional graph, and you have paid a lot of money for for mm -hmm. infinite and interconnect, which is really nice if you have it. But there is of course a more quasi grain topology with within that net. Would that essentially help in terms of building a more because this way of, of building a hierarchy is universal basically once you have one level you can put a next level and the next level is this already in DASO or is, is the number of levels basically fixed and you can't build something like a pyramid scheme or something else of it. Well, I wouldn't want to build a pyramid scheme. No, no, of <laughs> well, if you're on top, that's a very good mess. <laughs> but so this is actually an interesting idea. The, the part of what you're talking about is in federated learning, mm -hmm. which is sort of an open that, question. That a full up question. Yep. <laughs> so like this is quite a it's not easy to get around this, like the, this hierarchical scheme, because you sort of you lose information when you're working a little bit when things are a little bit stale and things tend to diverge. Mm -hmm. So you only have like a certain window, so to speak, where you can communicate and not lose any information or really diverge so much. So you need to have some amount of speed. And even when you put the other problem with this is if you get to very, very, very large scales, what tends to happen is actually your gradients break down. So even in this, in this ML perf HPC, for example, and even in the normal ML perf benchmarks, you tend to see a limit at around um, like 2048 most of the time, even with these large data sets, which are seven, eight terabytes, even at that point, most of the time, it starts to break down and you start to see more divergence and things don't work so well anymore. So it's kind of an open question about how to train at that point, which is why actually we see those training times that are 11 days on 128 because our 128 GPUs or TPUs because you can't increase it anymore without essentially diverging. And that's another issue. Mm -hmm. you, you, so it's kind of, it theoretically could go into DASO and into this hierarchical framework, but it's still an open question. Is there is still an email? Yeah. yeah, I think that it would work, but it does take something, something more than a weighted average. A weighted average, in my opinion, this was, <laughs> Once I built all of it, I needed some way to merge them together. Mm -hmm. And the weighted average was the simplest means to an end. Uh, and it was also the most efficient operation that wouldn't block everything in time. Okay, cool. Uh, I, uh, I, 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 you know, I have the, I have the opportunity <laughs> because Daniel is right next to me. But I, I would love to the, the others to join in and maybe, maybe uh, 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 have some questions to him as well. 
So are there any people from the audience joining here and, and, and ask, having questions for Danielle? Um, from not, not yelling, but just asking regularly if this is fine as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you were showing uh, these ben benchmarks in the end. Have you, have you used this already for, you know, apart from the benchmarking for actual real life, uh, uh training of any any specific models so this was any, used to, sorry anything anything apart from like like the usual suspects like ImageNet or something like that at the time i did also train on a semantic segmentation task and actually on resnet 50 it was a 34 percent decrease in training time for deso while maintaining mm -hmm. accuracy the 20 percent was actually from I don't remember the name of it. It was some semantic segmentation model from NVIDIA that we trained on cityscapes. So this is essentially, it's a data set that's um, the view of like a bike rider or someone from the road and it's kind of snapshots saying what's road and what's what's cars mm -hmm. and buildings and stuff. We trained it there and it also performed quite well, although it did take a little bit more training. It did take a little bit more tuning and it was a little bit limited in its scalability. It, instead of scaling to 256, it, it really maintained accuracy only to 128 and then it broke down. Although Horovod also broke down there. So I think it may have been a, a network parameter issue. Okay. And 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 how, how bad was the breakdown after the, the, the 128 then for these? Oh, it, it broke down from, I think it was something in the range of I, I don't remember them, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but if it was 75%. After, when it started to break down, it really it hits a wall and it drops to like 35%. Oh, okay. We did testing here as well. And after, oh God, I don't want to snap it to somewhere. <laughs> after 256 at, at 512, it really drops to like 50%, 40%. I mean, Horobot also drops from 70, from okay. 74.8 here to 60. It, uh, once you hit these large batch effects, essentially, they really your performance you it, it is not um it's not subtle okay <laughs> good thank you My pleasure. also really nice talk this was really interesting <laughs> thank you thank you any other questions from the audience i have to i have to possible that you do go first so what uh, one of the things I, I was i was thinking about because you're basically doing the average of course you can do 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 other optimizations but in the end you said of course i'm taking information from further and further back in time and i somehow have to compute the influence on that one and and in hpc and you know, standard hpc if you go from that what you basically used a lot in 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 kind of a simple domain decomposition view of, of some some something is that you use basically more and more memory mm -hmm. to store the older information in some sense we call this ghost cells or whatever it doesn't matter how you call it but in the end you kind of store the history of what you got and then still have the opportunity to 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 look at this and and use it in an intelligent way is this a way to go or do you really think the power is in lo looking at the state of the models rather than the results of the model so where, where, where do you see where do you see possibility for improvement so keeping these this in mind i actually have this in the backup this is this is how the atom method works mm -hmm. the atom method actually aggregates this over time and essentially it takes a factor and it just essentially scales the previous the previous runs it scales them down mm -hmm. so essentially you have that, that exponential moving average and so it would be a way to store this, but since we're already storing more and more of the model, we actually start to run into memory bounds mm -hmm. sometimes. This, this can happen with larger models. But even Adam, as it's been seen, it doesn't really give you a very accurate model. Mm -hmm. Like at a certain point, you actually want the model to kind of find a better minimum. And it's harder when you have these moving averages or if you're just hanging on to the, the last information for so long. So when you're kind of loading these things, it's sort of a balance that has to be struck. This is actually something that's quite difficult to find because if you want to use the old information, you have to look it up. And now you're doing multiple operations for each 
section of your data. And that is also something that's also, that is not optimized anymore. So it's, it's one more thing to kind of add to the stack of things to deal with. So it, it just kind of gets more and more difficult. And, and go, going two, two rounds now, two. Mm -hmm. two. The first one is, and you already mentioned it, federated learning. So many of the things you do here have a close resemblance to, to actually federated learning setups. Very much. Where you, where you also have the, I, I, always, I always say, if you, if you ever do, can do an efficient computation distributed over the internet, like I know Bitcoin <laughs> or something like that, or, or Ethereum, which is which is maybe, maybe the no, they just switched. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> One of those. <laughs> One of those. <laughs> Dogecoin. We don't care. <laughs> uh, 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 so uh, th then you can also probably do it do it on an HPC system in some sense if you still do do the communication and need need strong communication. So uh, uh, how how do you see the interplay between those? Because of course. Uh, uh, for for certain data sets, let it be in in earth system science or in medical science, we will energy is another <laughs> one. We will definitely have distributed data sets, so we will have a federated learning approach from the beginning. Do you see some crosstalk between those two domains? I usually have the feeling that that the federated one takes more care of security right now and doing the averages while you are more on the performance view. But in the end, I think both of them have to somewhat come together. So the goal of any, I, I say this as a, um, as a parallel programmer, I, mm -hmm. I cut my teeth originally in the heat framework. Mm -hmm. And this was all about how do we parallelize operations? Whenever you try to parallelize something, the goal is to hide the communication behind the exactly. behind the computation. Yeah. The worst thing to do is just be waiting for something to finish. It's just to, I mean, come on, we've all been there. We, we've all been waiting for a bus to arrive, and we're just sitting there twiddling our thumbs while we wait. We don't want that. So when we try to get to these areas where we have federated learning, the hard part is keeping it from diverging too much sort of kind of where I think this could go and sort of how I how I sort of dream it happening. I don't know if it's a <laughs> if it's logical to think that or not, would be to force them to diverge differently, if that makes sense. Because there are other things that show there are pruning methods which can take out 90% of uh, the resident 50, for example. You can maintain your act that 75% accuracy. You can maintain that and remove over 95% of the network parameters. So obviously not all of it's important, but I mean, my idea would be, okay, so federated data, how do we actually get something that generalizes without bias showing? Mm -hmm. The hardest part of federated data is, as you said, keeping the security fixed. But if we do that, essentially we have a thumbprint on each of them. Mm -hmm. So there was an example that I saw of, I think it was medical images. And medical images in one place, the camera that they used had the tint that was slightly different. And what this did was all the images essentially from there had like a reddish tint. Mm -hmm. And correcting for something like that is a local change that you can't communicate to the rest of everyone because everyone's normalized, but their normalization is different. So handling that is kind of, you have to start from the data and move up. Mm -hmm. For something like this, the, the federated idea behind it, it can work, but I think it's still a little bit farther away because on the HPC side of things in the communications, it still isn't fully matured enough to have the delay long enough to actually wait for a federated use case, mm -hmm. just because the internet is, <laughs> Slow. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and and uh, I'm, I'm still in the show, so just scream stop if you have a question, please. Um, the, 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 the other direction I was going into, because you were basically, uh, again, going, going back to the, to the loss of information over time. Dibanjan, we are with you shortly, but now, now I was quicker. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, um, right. so, so one of the interesting things for us, for example, is in a combination of HPC and large ML sets, which 
can be run on the same computers, producing data over time that can no longer be written to file in its fully set. So we have some form of fast streaming mm -hmm. um, source where we always just have a window of the inf information, but it, it is so huge that only part of it actually fits in the overall system. So our, our um, our application is kind of we can never have the full data set. If I remember correctly, the application is the what is it? It's one of the higher level triggers for the I forget which physics experiment. Oh, oh, we can we can talk about CMS. We can also talk about a simulation. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but it's the it's kind of you know you have this window on reality and then it's gone over some time. So so how do you think parallelization in 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 that development can play a role? Because it's a very different setup, you know. It's like you don't have a fixed data set that you somewhat load in your in your mm -hmm. application and that you work with. It's, it's more like you only just have a window of something you will never see incomplete. So actually, the data staging is one of the kind of actually the major parts of large scale trainings at this mm -hmm. point. On some of the methods, I hate to go back to the ML perf HPC, but I just finished this last week while in Rome. <laughs> Nice. Uh, nice might, uh, wouldn't be the word I use. <laughs> it, it had to happen. But <clears throat> in some cases, 10% of our training time is just dedicated to copying the data from disk on into main memory. But oh, that's still low. Yeah. I mean, even then, like, there's this for some larger use cases. <laughs> and these were less optimized data loaders. So the idea of how do you, how do you train on that? I mean, theoretically, if you can train a model on that section of the data that that model has a representation of the data set itself, it's it would be essentially a fitting algorithm is, is the easy way to kind of contextualize it. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good fit. That's that's kind of the hard part of it is how do you determine how well it fits to this? And if you are throwing out good data or not, this would be something that would take testing. I, I Yeah, it, you could do something like this, but more importantly, at a large scale, it, it comes down to the data itself and the model that you would save at the end, because your model can be megabytes depending on what you need it for, but you still have to get a representation of the data that you're seeing in that moment. If you were to generate one continuous model that would learn off of each of them, or if you were to say, okay, we have multiple models and now we need to kind of join these together somehow, I don't know if that would work. That would that is a very interesting question. I mean, if you start with the same seed, theoretically, you could you could you could view them as getting similar places, but it's such a neural networks for all of for the good that they are, they are actually extremely delicate, which is why we have to be careful about randomness and seeds and all these different parameters that have to be fixed to actually make sure. I mean, I'm talking to physicists. It's so many parameters that you have to fix to actually get a, a bead on what's really happening that it can be difficult. And it's just one of those things that has to be kept in mind when designing a system for it. Okay. So theoretically it's possible, but it's also possible that you get wildly different networks, even starting with the same seed and you have very similar data. Would be something to, to look into. Thank you very much. And now Devanjan, I'm sorry for, for stealing your time. You're on. It's absolutely fine, Michael. Okay, so I have a question that I like to know how this parallelism uh, works for semantic segmentation like uh, MR images. So where if we decompose the uh, our imaging data set, is a huge data sets, then its semanticity loses. So how we handle the semantic segmentation uh, in using parallel GPUs or parallel processing? So you can actually use most things nowadays. You can use, let's go to the full list here. So for semantic segmentation, you can use most of these, these methods. Uh, most, of, most of the layers in semantic segmentation are typically either, um, well, it depends what you're looking for. For a masked RCNN, the parallelization was typically, the easiest method is to use batch parallelization, although you can't have, again, you're limited by the size of your um, the VRAM. You can also do something similar to what Megatron did, and you can essentially, you can use transformer layers, and since transformers are essentially just outer products, you can parallelize this with just kind of splitting your matrix in more or less trivial ways, where you have essentially, I have to do this mirrored and this is difficult. 
you have like a matrix here that's split along this dimension, then you have a matrix here that's split along this dimension, and then when you do the matrix multiplication, you go across here and down here, and you don't have to talk to each other. This is the way that they get to very, very large transformer layer sizes. Um, sort of the misconception here, something that is hard to imagine, is that the model itself actually doesn't take up most of the most of the, the memory. What takes up most of the memory is actually your backwards step and the optimization steps. Because when you're storing all of these all of these values, you you actually have to store quite small numbers. And if you're storing them in, I think it's if you're storing them in half precision, you lose a lot. So you have to store them in either float their in, in 32 bit or uh, yeah, it's just I think most of them are, are saved in 32, but they're computed in 16. So it's it's a bit of a kind of it's a difficult question to answer depending on the use case that you're looking for for semantic segmentation. I guess is the best way to put it. There are methods, and most of these are just trained simply with batch parallelism. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but uh, there is a uh, addition to this. Uh, I have an, another follow up questions. Uh, suppose uh, I have using batch processing and and for each node, uh, I am just uh, processing one batch in each node. And for each node, uh, we have defined gradients. Then how do we calculate the resultant gradient for, for the entire data set during training? Sorry, can you repeat that? The last one was a bit hard to hear, the last part of your question. Could you please repeat it, Banja? Okay, so suppose we have a, a number of batches and we are running each and every batch in a different nodes mm -hmm. and we have different gradients for each and every nodes. So how do we get the model? How do we update the model parameters in that case? Oh, this would typically just be if you're not doing something like DASO or anything, you would average your gradients and then you would do a normal optimization step. If you were to do it with Atom or SGD, you would just do it the same way. Uh, this is very similar to if you just have um, batch parallelism is essentially very similar to standard SGD actually in this in this idea. Because in standard SGD, what you do is you actually have, you, this is the same average here. Right here, this average is the same. And so essentially your sum here would just be summing over all of your batches across the processes, and then you divide by the full, the full total. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is, this is synchronized? Yes, this would be synchronized. Okay. okay. For the non-synchronized cases, like with DASO, this is actually a very similar idea, but instead of it being just this one term, you'd have this local term, and then you'd also have a second, a third term here, which would be in charge, which would have the the stale network parameters. So this would be, uh, I think it's a W I minus J minus one, and that would be that would be over here, which would just be a modifier. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any, any other questions from the audience? Thank you, Devanjan. Um, I have, I have uh, two, two maybe final questions. The first one is, what do you think are the next best steps to go forward with scalability with, with DASO and, and other networks? So I think that as far as scalability goes, I think it comes down to this weighted average. I think that's the weak link essentially in this is how to actually to increase scalability and to increase speed and efficiency. It actually comes down to this. And that also comes down to learning rates and how big the steps are and how do we use the same learning rate for the local steps and for the global steps? These are things to consider. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of where that's coming from as well as how do we do that one? So that's kind of the the biggest question mark is how do we get there? And as for it's more accuracy and scalability kind of go hand in hand for me. Mm -hmm. 
And, and, and very practical questions. So, so some of us, uh, I, I know at HDDR, I, I routinely using Horobot. Mm -hmm. We're very happy users of, of our own clusters and also the ZIH infrastructure. So going up to a few hundred GPUs mm -hmm. is, is now standard with some of our models. If, if we would like to see the increase of DAS or how easy is it to switch actually? I mean, sometimes you just, you know, you're just lazy and say, ah, I have to work at least a day to do everything. And then the 20%, uh, come on. <laughs> so that is the struggle with this. Is uh, I would, I, it was, what model, what language are you working in? Uh, that's uh, PyTorch models mainly okay. with Horobot. I would mostly recommend actually with PyTorch, you don't really need Horobot anymore. And in fact, I found that sometimes it doesn't quite help that much. Mm -hmm. If you weren't, if you want to, to do just the simplest version of this, I would actually recommend essentially just using uh, where are you? Torch distributed data parallel. They do a great job. Nickel communications actually work quite well now. Sometimes you have to you have to communicate the local like the local host of, of rank zero, and you have to essentially point everyone to that. But once you do that, then it's essentially just runs and you don't need Horobot on top of it. So that would be the simplest way. Dasso is a little bit more involved. I will say it requires a trainer in the newest instance where you would essentially just wrap this in a Dasso trainer class and then you'd essentially just hit start on it is the main idea. But it would probably take a day of work to get there. And even then, I will, I will preface it by saying, <laughs> It does, convergence does change. Making this fully automatic is difficult. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, it's definitely easy, you can do it in a day and see the same things, that, that would just be disingenuous. Is there a link in your presentation? You know what, that's the link I forgot. See? <laughs> I'm very confident <laughs> that the audience listening yeah. <laughs> do a good GitHub search and, and this find is, it this link. It's in the Heat repository. Wonderful. Okay. So in Heat, where we do our this is also a distributed, a distributed statistics and linear algebra package that's GPU accelerated, which I'd also recommend since I believe you all have very large data sets. For doing smaller things, this actually is quite good. Uh, essentially more or less basic statistical operations, clustering. We have all of that. If you can load your data into memory, you can use this. This is just called HEAT, uh, Hempel's Analytics. What is it? Hempel's Analytics Toolkit. And it's in there. This is this is where I, I, I essentially work to keep this stuff. Okay, cool. If there are no more questions in the audience, I thank you very much again for your time. <laughs>